19-year-old Morgan Bauer vanished just weeks after moving from Aberdeen, South Dakota, to Atlanta, Georgia, for just $20 to her name in February 2016. She'd found housing from Craigslist, where she met a man who agreed to let her live with him in exchange for help with chores until she could afford to start paying rent. But the living arrangement fell through less than a day after Morgan arrived, leaving her in urgent need of both money and a place to stay. Text messages would later reveal that Morgan and her roommate had a fallen out, but the nature of the disagreement is unclear. The teen's mother, Sherry Sickmeller, now Keenan, told local station WSB-TV that Morgan had left her clothes at the apartment because she didn't know what else to do. A situation became even more desperate when a tax refund she was expecting never came through. Morgan knew that her parents' door was always open and that her family would welcome her back to South Dakota with open arms, but she was determined to make it in Atlanta. So she checked into a motel and began dancing at strip clubs for cash. According to court documents, Morgan was seen at a club in Gainesville on February the 25th, 2016. She left with a group of people who dropped her off at a gas station in nearby Covington and was last seen getting into a green Mitsubishi Eclipse. Her final Instagram video which was posted the following day, appeared to show the young woman walking in a park with an unidentified man trailing behind her. Now, Morgan had very little money to her name at the time, which indicates that she lacked the resources to purposely disappear and also suggests that she may have been vulnerable due to her financial desperation. During the initial stages of Morgan's missing persons investigation, Officials said that they didn't suspect foul play. Morgan's phone last pinged in Portadale, which is roughly 35 miles off, just over 56 kilometers outside of Atlanta. In one of her last social media posts, she mentioned having landed a job at a strip club, although several club owners reportedly told investigators that Morgan had applied for a job but didn't have the proper paperwork to get hired. During a 2017 interview with WSB-TV, an employee who worked at a Waffle House near the club where Morgan was last seen mentioned seeing her on a few occasions when she came in after her shift. But she didn't seem to have much information to offer beyond that, including any details about the night that Morgan was last seen alive. All along, information about Morgan's last movements and the circumstances surrounding her disappearance has been scarce. And due to the sensitive and ongoing nature of the investigation, even Morgan's family wasn't privy to all of the details of her case. Until 2022, investigators believed Morgan's last social media post was made on February 25th. A friend of the woman discovered that the post was actually made on the 26th, causing authorities to rethink their entire timeline and the possibilities surrounding Morgan's fate. Now, Morgan's mother, Sherry Sickmella, now Keenan, didn't want the young woman to move to Georgia, but Morgan wanted to live in the big city and be on her own, and her family wasn't going to stand in her way. Sherry was already worried to begin with, but the situation became even more concerning when Morgan just stopped communicating with her loved ones. She later told Dateline that it was unlike her daughter to go radio silent. Even if Morgan was angry at her mother or didn't want to talk to her for some reason, she would have likely contacted her grandmother. And what scared Sherry the most was knowing that Morgan was in survival mode as she struggled to gain her footing in her new city. From the moment Morgan vanished, her mother pleaded with the public for help, finding her. She also urged her daughter to get in touch somehow 
and reassured Morgan that she wasn't in trouble. In the weeks following the teen's disappearance, Sherry told Dateline that she feared Morgan might be unable to get in touch because of whatever had happened to her. Sherry and her husband traveled to Atlanta to search for their daughter and raise awareness about her case. They passed out flyers and took to social media to spread the word to as many people as possible. But as the years dragged on with no solid answers, Morgan's loved ones became increasingly desperate to find out what had happened to her. During an interview with news station WXIA in early 2023, Sherry said she forgave whoever was responsible for Morgan's disappearance, but to please just bring her back. At the time, the devastated mother feared that Morgan might have been trafficked. It was in late July of 2023 that the FBI and multiple other law enforcement agencies were seen searching a residence in Porterdale, less than a mile or just under two kilometers from the park where Morgan filmed her last Instagram video. According to news sources, the home is a historic mansion, locally known as the Porter House. A police spokesperson revealed that a search warrant was being executed in light of new details pertaining to the case, but declined to explain why officers from the Peoria, Illinois Police Department were spotted at the scene. Local station Channel 2 Action News flew over the site with a helicopter and captured footage of law enforcement tents set up next to a large house in a wooden area. Other video provided by the police showed federal agents painstakingly combing through the property. Just days later, authorities announced the arrests of two suspects in connection with Morgan's disappearance. According to an indictment, Jonathan Alexander Warren and Caitlin Goble both put their hands around Morgan's neck. The cause of death is listed as strangulation. The document further alleges that Warren and Goble dismembered and burned Morgan's body and destroyed other physical evidence. Law enforcement hasn't specified whether any human remains were found, only revealing that items of evidentiary value had been recovered from the scene. 27-year-old Jonathan Warren was arrested in Los Angeles on suspicion of multiple felonies, including murder, malice murder, aggravated assault, concealing a death, and necrophilia, as well as a misdemeanor charge for tampering with evidence. During the search in Porterdale, shortly before the arrests, police confirmed that the property belonged to Dr. Robert and Judith Warren, suggested a possible relation to the suspect. The property owners were reportedly cooperating with the investigation. The second suspect, 27-year-old Caitlin Goble, was arrested in Peoria, Illinois, which could help to explain the presence of Peoria police officers at the scene of the search that preceded the arrest. She also faces several felony counts, including murder, malice murder, concealing a death, aggravated assault, and tampering with evidence. The suspect's connection to Morgan is unclear and authorities are remaining tight-lipped about most other information surrounding the case. For now, the most anyone can do is wait patiently for the details to unfold in court. For over three decades, the brutal murder of Kathy Esposito, a college student, cast a long shadow over Prescott, Arizona. The heinous crime remained unsolved, haunting the community until now. Yavapai County Sheriff's Office deputies have finally cracked the case, bringing closure and justice to Esposito's family. And this article will delve into the harrowing story of Kathy Esposito's murder, the long quest for her killer and the recent breakthrough that has brought a measure of solace to those who loved her. June the 13th, 1987 marked a fateful day in the history of Prescott, a day that would forever change the town and its residents. On that seemingly ordinary morning, Kathy Esposito, a 23-year-old college student embarked on what should have been a peaceful hike along the picturesque Thumbview Trail. Now, the trail is known for its breathtaking vistas and serene beauty. 
and it was a popular destination for outdoor enthusiasts, attracting hikers, nature lovers, and students alike. Cathy used to seek solace in nature, attracting hikers, nature lovers, and students like Cathy seeking solace in nature. Cathy's day began much like any other. The sun was just beginning to cast its warm glow over the rugged landscape as she made her way to the trailhead, riding her bicycle. With her backpack slung over her shoulders, she set out on her solitary journey. The air was crisp and the promise of a beautiful day hung in the atmosphere. As she ventured deeper into the heart of Thumbu Trail, surrounded by the soothing sounds of nature, something sinister lurked in the shadows. The tranquility of the trail was about to be shattered by a horrifying sequence of events that would leave an indelible mark on the town and its people. Hikers in the vicinity, out to enjoy the same natural beauty that had drawn Cathy to the trail that morning, suddenly found themselves startled by desperate cries for help echoing through the trees. Panic and confusion gripped them as they rushed toward the source of the cries. The scene that unfolded before them was nothing short of a nightmare. Cathy lay on the trail, lifeless, surrounded by the breathtaking yet haunted landscape of Thumbute. Her young life had been brutally cut short in a manner that defied comprehension. She had been subjected to a level of violence that was difficult to fathom. A single gunshot wound to the eye had marked the beginning of her ordeal, followed by a savage stabbing. And finally, a gruesome attack with a rock and ratchet. The trail that had been her sanctuary had become the setting for a horrifying and senseless crime. However, when Esposito died, DNA analysis wasn't being used, so the murderer was never identified. The murder of Kathy Esposito was unsolved, but it remained open and active for 36 years. Now recently, Sheriff David Rhodes named Brian Scott Bennett as her killer. Multiple pieces of evidence have been crucial in identifying Bennett as the perpetrator. Forensic analysis has uncovered DNA evidence at the crime scene that directly links him to the murder of Kathy Esposito. In addition, his fingerprints were found on various items at the scene, solidifying the case against him. Now, after thorough analysis, Forensic experts were able to confirm a match between the DNA found on the wrench and the DNA extracted from Bennett's remains. This revelation significantly strengthened the case against Bennett as the prime suspect in Kathy Esposito's murder. Additional evidence and the testimony of witnesses further supported the conclusion that Bennett was indeed responsible for the crime. He'd been seen in the vicinity of the hiking trail on the day of the murder, as several witnesses reported his suspicious behavior. Authorities also discovered Bennett's fingerprints on a water bottle found near the crime scene. Furthermore, investigators have connected Bennett to a series of other attacks in the area. Witnesses have come forward providing crucial information that places him at the scene of these crimes. Kathy Esposito was Bennett's first victim, but not his last. Sheriff David Rhodes, in his announcement, disclosed the shocking details of Bennett's reign of terror. In April 1990, he attacked and sexually assaulted a second victim on the same trail and at the same time of day as Esposito's murder. The victim was camping with her boyfriend and ventured out for a hike on Thumb Butte Trail. Bennett ambushed her, held a rock to her head, and subjected her to a horrifying ordeal before fleeing into the woods. The horror didn't end there. In July 1990, Bennett was accused of an attempted assault at a house party in Chino Valley, Arizona. A young woman who'd been drinking sought respite in a bedroom, but Bennett followed her, attempting to sexually assault her. Witnesses managed to break down the door and Bennett fled. He was arrested by the Chino Valley Police Department, but later acquitted due to conflicting eyewitness testimonies. On June the 2nd, 1993, Bennett struck again, this time at the Prescott Post Office. He approached a fourth victim, holding her at knife point, and subjected her to multiple sexual assaults. 
Despite his arrest, a lack of evidence once again led to no consequences for his actions. On January the 27th, 1994, Bennett returned to his home state of Kentucky and died by suicide. In 2020, detectives had a break in the case when investigating Bennett's second victim. Familial genealogy identified two brothers who could have been the suspect, and one of the matches came back as Bennett. Two years later, Yavapai County gathered enough evidence to obtain a warrant to exhume his body from a cemetery in Kentucky. Then in March 2023, DNA linked Bennett to the 1991 case on Thumb Butte Trail. Through the work of dedicated volunteers, numerous detectives, and the many partners who give their time and their hearts to solving these cold cases. Four women were given either closure, peace, or validation today, said Sheriff Rhodes. The resolution of this decades-old case has had a profound impact on the Prescott community. For years, the unsolved murder of Kathy Esposito was a dark cloud hanging over the town. Now, with Bennett's identity confirmed and justice served, the residents can begin to heal. It's a testament to the tenacity of law enforcement, the power of forensic science, and the enduring spirit of a community that never gave up on finding the truth. The years of uncertainty and fear have left an indelible mark on the people of Prescott. There was a collective sense of vulnerability, knowing that the killer had never actually been brought to justice. Families were weary, especially of allowing their loved ones to venture out into the picturesque yet perilous trails that surround the town. A cloud of suspicion hung over the town's youth during Bennett's reign of terror, and the fear of the unknown weighed heavily on everyone's minds. In the aftermath of the breakthrough, there's been a palpable shift in the atmosphere. The residents of Prescott have found a renewed sense of security. There's a collective sigh of relief, as Bennett's identity and fate have been sealed forever. Parents no longer need to caution their children with warnings about the unsolved murder. The spectre that haunted Prescott has been vanquished. This case has also showcased the resilience of law enforcement and the dedication of those who never gave up hope. Detectives, investigators, and volunteers dedicated countless hours to pursuing justice, combing through old evidence and never abandoning their quest. They exemplify the unwavering spirit of those who are committed to bringing closure and justice to the victims and their families. The story of Kathy Esposito's murder is a poignant reminder of the resilience of law enforcement, the advances in forensic technology, and the unwavering determination of a community to seek justice. After 36 years of darkness, a case has finally seen the light of truth. The victims have been given closure, peace, and validation. Thanks to the relentless efforts of dedicated investigators, volunteers, and the power of science. While the scars may never fully heal, Prescott can now move forward with the knowledge that justice has been served for Kathy Esposito and all those affected by Brian Scott Bennett's reign of terror. The resolution of this case also serves as a beacon of hope for other communities dealing with unsolved crimes. It demonstrates that justice, even after decades, is possible with advancements in forensic science and the unwavering dedication of those who refuse to give up the fight for the truth. The memory of Kathy Esposito will endure as a symbol of resilience and perseverance in the face of darkness, proving that even the coldest of cases can one day find resolution. For many, small-town America is synonymous with close-knit communities and wholesome family values. But dark secrets often lurk beneath the surface and wear away at the squeaky clean veneer that is shown to outsiders. Sometimes these inconvenient truths become impossible to conceal yet remain shrouded and ill paved a long and painstaking path to justice. That's the case when it comes to the disappearance of Crystal Rogers, a mother of five 
who hasn't been seen or heard from in over eight years. 35-year-old Crystal Rogers went radio silent just before the 4th of July holiday in 2015. After failing to reach her for two days, her mother, Sherry Ballard, reported her missing. At the time of her disappearance, Crystal was living in Bardstown, Kentucky, with Brooks Hook, her boyfriend and the father of her youngest child. Hook claimed that he last saw Crystal on the night of July the 3rd. He said she was sitting in their living room playing on her cell phone when he went to bed, and that she wasn't home when he awoke the next morning. This wasn't unusual, according to a book, who told investigators that it was customary for Crystal to leave when she needed space. In fact, he admitted that their relationship was rocky and claimed that Crystal often slept at a relative's house after they argued. On the same day Crystal was reported missing, a Chevy Impala was found abandoned on the side of the Blue Grass Parkway, not far from her home. The vehicle was unlocked and had a flat tire, and Crystal's keys, phone, and purse were inside the car. Crystal, nowhere to be found. Even more curiously, the driver's seat was pushed way too far back for someone as short as Crystal to reach the gas pedal indicated that a much taller person had parked the deserted sedan. One thing was for certain, Crystal would have never willingly abandoned her children. Moreover, those who knew her said it would be highly out of character for her to leave her house in the middle of the night because she supposedly needed space. For these reasons alone, Crystal's family and friends knew something was terribly wrong and that she was in serious danger if she was still alive. Unfortunately, all efforts to find the missing woman failed to turn up any clue to her whereabouts. Brooks Hook was a person of interest in Crystal's disappearance from the very start of the case. By the time law enforcement officially named him as a suspect three months later, about the FBI wrapped up the day. We didn't find her Crystal Rogers disappeared. As Remember Crystal Rogers of Bardstown near the intersection. Tommy and Sherry Ballard. to bring Crystal home. The investigators were pretty sure that Crystal was dead, but her body remained missing, and evidence tying Hook to the crime remained skits at best. Hook denied any wrongdoing, and authorities had no choice but to cut him loose while they continued work in the case. At the time, Brooks's brother, Nick Hook, was a Bardstown police officer. He was questioned about the case and was fired from his job for allegedly refusing to cooperate with the investigation. Nick allegedly failed a polygraph test. More specifically, he was accused of lying when he said he didn't know where Crystal was. Despite these suspicious findings, Nick continued to deny any involvement in Crystal's disappearance or even knowledge of her whereabouts. He insisted he was being 100% honest with the interrogator and became increasingly defensive throughout the interview. Nick eventually lost his temper, calling the detective a bucket liar. Not just me. I showed you. Dude, I don't give a f and what your f computer said. During an earlier conversation with law enforcement, Nick had claimed that he rarely spoke with Brooks and that he was unaware that Crystal had gone missing. The interviewer expressed doubt that something so serious could happen involving a close family member and nobody would have told him, but he stuck stubbornly to his story. A later review of the interrogation footage showed that Nick took a phone call from Brooks during his very first interview with law enforcement. According to police, he claimed that Brooks had encouraged him to cooperate but protect himself. Surveillance footage captured just hours after the interview showed Nick and Brooks pulling into the driveway at their family's farm at the same time further disproving Nick's initial claim that he and Brooks seldom interacted. Nick Hook's name would come up repeatedly 
in connection with events surrounding Crystal's disappearance. But much like his brother, he continued to walk free due to a lack of evidence to justify an arrest. Sherry and Tommy Ballard never gave up the search for their daughter, even after the official investigation stalled. They left no stone unturned and kept extremely detailed records of their findings, including the tiniest tidbits of information and the most seemingly insignificant observations. The Ballards also extended the search to social media by creating a Facebook page dedicated to finding Crystal. These efforts felt necessary since, from the family's perspective, law enforcement didn't seem particularly invested in solving the case. In November 2016, roughly 16 months after Crystal went missing, Tommy Ballard was shot square in the chest on a family-owned property during a hunting trip with his grandson. He died instantly and his murder remains unsolved to this day. Sherry Ballard believes Tommy was targeted because of his relentless quest to find Crystal. Both she and Tommy had previously stated during interviews that they believed Brooks Hook was involved in their daughter's disappearance and Sherry continues to suspect that Brooks either killed Crystal or had someone else do it. She also believes he played a role in Tommy's murder. Tommy Ballard's father, Till Ballard, has also stated that he believes Crystal and her father's deaths are directly connected somehow. Speaking to the Lexington Herald leader in 2023, he said that Tommy wasn't going to stop searching until he found answers and that someone had to stop him. Both Crystal and her father's deaths are currently being investigated by the FBI, which took over the case in 2020. The quest for answers finally started to gain momentum after the agency stepped in and began searching properties connected to Hook, including his family's 245-acre farm. In July of 2023, a spokesperson announced that the FBI had made significant progress in bringing the case to its rightful conclusion, but they declined to go into detail about these alleged developments. The first arrest in connection with Crystal's disappearance finally came in September 2023 when 32-year-old Joseph Lawson was charged with criminal conspiracy to commit murder and complicity in tampering with physical evidence. Crystal's name was redacted from court documents listing the charges, but Lawson's attorney confirmed that the allegations against his client are related to the case. Lawson was never publicly named as a person of interest in Crystal's disappearance or death prior to his arrest, leaving civilians stunned by the news. According to Lawson's indictment, prosecutors believe he destroyed, mutilated, concealed, removed, or altered physical evidence relating to the case. He pleaded not guilty and has been held on bonds totaling $550,000. In October of 2023, nearly a month after Joseph Lawson's arrest, prosecutors charged Brooks Hook with Crystal's murder. The nature of the suspected connection between Lawson and Hook is unclear. It's extremely rare for authorities to pursue a murder charge with no body, but it's not unheard of and the authorities in this case, finally believe they have enough evidence to secure a conviction in Crystal's case. Hook pleaded not guilty and has been held at a maximum security facility on a $10 million bail as he awaits his next court date. The judge denied his request for lower bail, citing the gravity of the murder charge and his access to money. As of mid-November 2023, Hook's attorney has filed a motion requesting the dismissal of the judge currently overseeing the case due to potential bias stemming from an unrelated matter. According to family court records from 2017, the judge presided over a child custody battle 
between the woman Hooks dated after Crystal Rogers went missing, who was also named Crystal, and who Brooks is the father of her child. In his ruling, the judge clarified that his conclusions on the custody case had less to do with any suspicions against Hook than with his girlfriend's questionable parenting decisions. In a nine-page ruling, he wrote, the court is simply astonished that Crystal would want a relationship with this man, Brooks Hook, who is the prime suspect in the disappearance and presumed death of his previous girlfriend. Now, the court has not yet determined whether the judge will be replaced, but the prosecutors argued against the motion and the judge has denied harboring any bias toward Brooks Hook. In the meantime, it appears as though plans for another arrest may be in the works. According to court documents, authorities have the gun that they believe was used to kill Tommy Ballard. Brooks's brother, Nick Hook, allegedly sold the gun to a member of law enforcement using a fictitious name, leading many to believe that he could be the next suspect to face charges in the disturbing saga of death that has rocked Bardstown to its core. The gun's currently undergoing testing to confirm whether it was the murder weapon, and the results will most likely determine whether prosecutors will move forward with charges against Nick Hoop. Now, whether or not justice will come full circle for Crystal Rogers, Tommy Ballard, and their surviving family members remains to be seen. For now, the victim's loved ones are satisfied to see Brooks Hook finally being held accountable for his alleged crimes, and they're hoping that Nick Hook's arrest will come next. Closure seems like a distant dream for the loved ones of Sarah Yarbrough a young Washington woman whose murder went unsolved for decades after she was killed near her high school in 1991. Long-awaited justice finally came more than 30 years later, in 2023, when an unlikely suspect faced accountability for his actions in a court of law. On the morning of Saturday, December the 14th, 1991, Sarah Yarbrough awoke in a panic, thinking she was running late for drill practice. She threw on her uniform and rushed to her high school in Federal Way, Washington, only to realize she'd actually arrived early. With nothing else to do, she probably sat in her car and waited for her teammates to show up. When Sarah's teammates began to arrive for practice, they noticed her car in the parking lot, but Sarah herself was nowhere to be found. They began searching for her, only to turn up empty-handed. Less than an hour later, a pair of teen boys crossed paths with a suspicious-looking man while taking a shortcut through some bushes near the school. The suspect exited the bushes ahead of the boys, who noticed that he was acting strange but paid little attention to him otherwise. Moments later, the teens discovered Sarah's body, right where the man had been lurking, and just 300 feet, 100 meters, from where her car was parked. Sarah was partially clothed, with her jacket and several other clothing items laying in a pile nearby. She had been strangled to death with her nylon stockings, which were left tied around her neck. Drew Miller, one of the boys who discovered the murder scene, later told 48 Hours that it was clear, based on the appearance of Sarah's body, that she'd fought for her life during her final moments. He remembered seeing the mysterious suspect staring straight back at him after he and his friend discovered the body in fearing for his own life. The boys ran back to Drew's house and dialed 911. Responding, King County detectives noticed that there were no apparent signs of a struggle inside Sarah's car. Her purse, duffel bag, and orange juice were neatly placed in the front seat, leading investigators to speculate that she was lured to her death by a predator, tending to be a civilian in need of help, or that perhaps the killer had told her he lost his dog or his car keys. It would have been in Sarah's nature to help, according to her family and friends, who described her as a feisty but selfless and kind person. It was also possible that she'd been threatened with a weapon and complied with the killer's orders to walk off into the bushes. Meanwhile, the witnesses who found Sarah's body worked with police to create a composite sketch of the suspect, 
which was distributed in large numbers throughout the area. Now at the time, DNA technology was brand new, but investigators were able to glean a full profile from evidence at the crime scene. These initial findings, coupled with the witness accounts, made them fairly confident that they would soon solve the case. Unfortunately, the exact opposite happened. Authorities poured all their available resources into investigating the case, but leads dried up. The DNA profile remained unidentified and the case went cold. Speaking with 48 Hours in 2023, Drew Miller described how the police repeatedly came back to him and his friends in hopes of gleaning useful details about what they saw. He felt like he was under unimaginable pressure to come up with information that he simply didn't have as the wait for answers dragged on. Community members built a memorial bench in Sierra's honor outside her high school. In the absence of a suspect being identified and brought to justice, it was one of the few things they could do to help process their grief. The memorial was unveiled in 1993, roughly a year and a half after Sierra's murder. At a time when hope was lacking yet, many people probably still believed the case would be solved sooner rather than later. By the early 2000s, investigators had followed up on over 3,000 leads, yet Sarah's killer remained elusive. Even the DNA profile found at the crime scene failed to turn up any matches in the newly established national database of samples, belonging to convicted offenders famously known today as CODIS. But DNA technology was advancing rapidly and law enforcement continued to believe that the profile would eventually proved to be their smoking gun. In 2011, 20 years after Sarah's murder, detectives contacted Colleen Fitzpatrick, who helped pioneer a groundbreaking new investigative method that they hoped would help solve the case. Known as forensic genetic genealogy, the method involves identifying suspects through the DNA profiles of relatives who had shared their genetic information on public platforms like 23andMe and Ancestry.com. At a time when many police agencies were skeptical of genetic genealogy, the investigators tried to solve Sarah's murder were eager to give it a try. Shortly after joining the investigation, Fitzpatrick traced the suspect's family tree back to a man named Robert Fuller, who had come to America aboard the Mayflower during the 17th century. The Yarbrough family had a close friend named Bill Fuller, who suddenly became an unlikely person of interest in the case. He looked nothing like the composite sketch of the suspect, was decades older than the man witnesses had seen their Sarah's body, and the Yarbrough's simply didn't believe he was capable of killing their daughter. But law enforcement was determined to leave no stone unturned, and with no other directions to go in, they pursued the lead. Fuller voluntarily provided his DNA to police and was soon ruled out as a suspect, which meant that he was likely a distant relative of the killer. Despite the setback, Fitzpatrick remained confident that she was on the right track and the search continued. Fitzpatrick's team spent eight years scouring the Fuller family tree for a viable suspect and a breakthrough finally came in 2019 when they landed on a pair of brothers named Edward and Patrick Nicholas as possible candidates for a DNA match. The men were distant cousins of Bill Fuller. Edward's DNA was not a match, so investigators narrowed their focus on Patrick, who had not been mentioned even once in the thousands of tips they'd received. Patrick was divorced, lived alone, and didn't have any friends to speak of. He kept mostly to himself, and even more interestingly, didn't drive. Patrick relied solely on public transportation to get around, and the bus route he regularly took at the time of Sarah's murder drove right past her high school. Now detectives began getting really excited about the possibility that they'd identified the killer. They were even more stunned when they looked at a younger photo of Patrick who was 27 years old at the time of the murder because it bore a strong resemblance to the composite drawing of the suspect, leading law enforcement to believe they were closing in 
unsolved in this case. Though all they needed was a DNA sample from Patrick to compare to the evidence left behind at the crime scene. Undercover investigators began following Patrick around in hopes of surreptitiously obtaining the DNA sample. They eventually struck gold where they saw him discard two cigarette butts and a napkin outside a laundromat. Just days later, law enforcement received a phone call confirming that the results were a match to Sarah's killer. Patrick Nicholas was arrested, but it would ultimately be up to a jury to decide if the authorities had caught the correct suspect. Dream Miller, one of the teenage boys who caught a glimpse of the suspect before discovering Sarah's body told 48 Hours that when he saw Patrick Nicholas's mugshot, he knew without a doubt that law enforcement had finally captured the killer, who he described as the same guy, just older, and with the same evil eyes. When investigators told Nicholas they were investigating a young girl's murder, he didn't automatically deny any involvement in the case. Instead, he asked, what year? Interested. What we're investigating is, is the death of a young girl. Her name is Sarah Yarbrough. Yeah. He eventually stopped talking and asked for a lawyer. A review of Nicholas's criminal record spoke volumes about his propensity for violence against women. After the case finally went to trial in 2023, a survivor named Anne Crony spoke to 48 Hours about her terrifying encounter with the suspect in 1983, eight years before Sarah's death. She said Nicholas approached her near her car and struck up a conversation, and then he introduced himself by name and said he was new in town. He seemed normal at first, but he soon began to act strange and Crony started to feel uncomfortable. When she tried getting in her car to leave, Nicholas held a knife to her throat and tried to assault her. Remembering that he had mentioned he couldn't swim, Crony drove into a nearby river and swam away as fast as she could. By then, Nicholas already had a lengthy record, which included two convictions for previous attacks on women and a third conviction for an attempted assault. He pleaded guilty to another attempted assault charge for attacking Crony and received the maximum 10-year prison sentence, but he served just three and a half years before he was released back into society to continue his relentless campaign of terror against innocent women. If he'd served his full sentence, he would have been in prison and unable to murder Sarah Yarbrough in 1991. After killing Sarah, Nicholas went on to assault at least one more woman. He committed all of his known crimes before it was mandatory for law enforcement to collect suspects' DNA for entry into CODIS, enabling him to fly under the radar for decades to come. The judge banned the prosecution from mentioning Nicholas's criminal history at trial, leaving them to hope that they had a strong enough case to convict him without it. Thankfully, the jury found the 59-year-old guilty, and he was sentenced to nearly 46 years in prison. This time, he's unlikely to be released which means that he'll probably never be able to hurt anyone again. When decades pass with no arrests in the murder of a middle-class working mum from Virginia named Robin Lawrence, her loved ones began to wonder if her killer would ever be caught. Nearly 30 years later, justice may finally come full circle, thanks to breakthroughs in DNA technology and a dedicated team of investigators who made it their mission to solve the case. Ollie Lawrence Jr. was out of town on a business trip in November 1994, when his wife, Robin War Lawrence, stopped answering his calls. Concerned for the safety of Robin and the couple's young daughter, Ollie asked a family friend, Laurie Lindbergh, to check on them. Lindbergh and another friend drove to the Lawrence's home in Springfield, Virginia, and banged on the door. When nobody answered, the women circled around the house and found an open window. As the friends called out for Robin, her daughter Nicole wandered into view. She was dehydrated and dirty, and it was clear that she had been alone for a few days, but she was otherwise unharmed. The women climbed inside through the open window to retrieve the little girl and began searching for Robin. 
They soon discovered that the hallway leading into the master bedroom was completely covered in blood. Terrified by what they saw, they fled the home without looking any further and dialed 911 from a neighbor's house. Officers arrived at the scene to find Robin dead from multiple stab wounds. At the time of her murder, just five days shy of her 37th birthday, Robin was the director of the promotions department for an auto and tire company. She grew up in Syracuse, New York, where her father served as the city's first black council member and had met and married Ollie in the late 80s after divorcing from her first husband and moving to Washington, D.C. for a fresh start. Robin was a respected community member who got along with pretty much everyone in her life and her marriage seemed to be going well, leaving her loved ones baffled as they tried to figure out who might want her dead. Ollie was also at a loss to explain why someone would target his wife with such a horrific act of violence. Unable to cope with the heartbreak of what had happened, he didn't return to he and Robin's home until nearly a month after the murder. When he did finally go there, he only stayed for a few minutes. He put the house on the market and moved to nearby Alexandria, where he began the painstaking process of trying to heal and carry on with his life. In addition to having to emotionally process the loss of his wife, Ollie dealt with the added strain of also being considered a suspect in the crime, even though he was in the Bahamas at the time of her death. The vast majority of murder victims are killed by someone they know and had a close relationship with at some point. So it's normal for a victim's spouse to be the first suspect in these types of cases. Investigators found no evidence of forced entry at the scene leading them to believe that Robin may have been familiar enough with her attacker to actually let them in, or that the person may even have had a key to the home. The severity of Robin's injuries made them believe that she was murdered in a crime of passion, which only furthered their suspicions against her husband. There were no outward signs of a burglary or other material motive for the crime. So at the time, it made sense to think that Robin was killed in a fit of rage. For a long time, the police believed that Robin's murderer targeted her specifically and went to her home with one specific goal in mind, to leave knowing she was dead. Ollie, meanwhile, adamantly maintained his innocence in a 1995 interview with the Washington Post, saying that it blew his mind that the police thought he might be responsible for Robin's murder. He said he'd not been able to properly grieve his wife's death due to the scrutiny he was under, and he felt that law enforcement was spending too much of its time focusing on him. A police spokesperson disagreed, claiming that detectives hadn't narrowed their sights on a specific suspect, and without enough evidence to point the finger directly at Ollie, they had no choice but to let him remain free. DNA samples which were collected from evidence at the crime scene didn't match the profiles of anyone in law enforcement's offender database, but DNA technology was still in its infancy at the time, and the police held on to the evidence for possible retesting in the future. In the meantime, detectives continued to work the case, hoping a breakthrough would come sooner rather than later. But as the months turned into years, it became clear that they would have to work extremely hard to chase down their smoking gun. Robin's family also poured immense effort into their quest to bring her killer to justice. In the months immediately following Robin's murder, they held rallies, distributed flyers, and did everything in their power to raise awareness in the hopes that someone with information about the case would come forward. In 2019, police resubmitted the suspect's DNA sample for testing. A company that specializes in genetic genealogy, a relatively new process of finding people through their relatives' DNA, produced a profile and began searching genealogy databases where civilians had uploaded their genetic information. Experts spent three years piecing together a family tree before identifying a 51-year-old man from Niskayuna, New York, named Stephen Smirk, 
as Robin's suspected killer. After narrowing their focus on Smirk, law enforcement utilized another type of genetic profiling known as phenotyping to determine what the suspect might have looked like at the time of Robin's murder based on the DNA collected from the crime scene. They compared the image to old yearbook and driver's license photos of Smirk and immediately noticed a close resemblance, furthering their suspicion that Smirk was indeed the killer, but without a DNA sample from the suspect and a positive match or a confession, they couldn't move forward with an arrest. In 2023, two detectives traveled to Smirk's home in Connecticut County, New York, to question him about the case and hopefully obtain a DNA sample. They arrived right as he was taking out his trash. Smirk voluntarily provided his DNA and the investigators were excited because they believed they were extremely close to finally identifying Robin's killer. But they didn't even have to wait for the DNA results to come in before making an arrest. Shortly after arriving back at their hotel, they actually received a call from Smirk saying he was ready to talk about his involvement in Robin's murder. He must have known he was about to be caught. Smirk turned himself into a local police station and spoke voluntarily with the detectives. He admitted to Robin and killing Robin and gave a detailed confession of the crime. Eli Corey, who led the investigation, would later reveal in a news conference that Smirk chose Robin at random, marking a surprising departure from the previously held belief that she was specifically targeted by her killer. There was no prior connection between the killer and the victim, and Smirk had a completely clean criminal record when he finally came forward, which explains how he managed to fly under the radar for nearly three decades. At the time of the murder, he was in the army and was stationed at nearby Fort Myer. Afterwards, he went on to marry, raise children, and live a completely normal lifestyle. Smirk was extradited to Fairfax County, Virginia, where he's being held on a second-degree murder charge. Speaking with the Washington Post shortly after Smirk's arrest, Bonnie Lawrence said he was completely shocked to learn that his wife's alleged killer had finally been caught. In his own words, he said, you could have probably knocked me over with a feather. After waiting 29 years with no answers, Oli had become doubtful that the case would ever be solved. He now lives in France and learned about the arrest after receiving an email instructing him to call a detective. Oli told the Post that he understood and respected law enforcement's need to rule him out as a suspect, but he still feels that the police focused too heavily on him, especially after he proved he was out of the country at the time of the murder, and the investigators failed to turn up any compelling evidence that he might have played a role in Robin's death. And while he's happy that someone is finally being held accountable for the horrific crime, he said that the news of the arrest came with mixed emotions because it resurrected the loss and grief. And as the case works its way through the court system, more details about exactly what happened on the night of Robin's murder are likely to come to light. But at this moment, there's been no updates since Smirk's arrest and it's unclear whether he's entered a plea or when his next hearing is scheduled. On the morning of February the 3rd, 1996, an observant passerby noticed that the lights were out and the doors were locked at the Lil Champ Mini Mart in Orlando, Florida. Now, this was unusual because the store was usually open at that time, prompting a concerned civilian to call the police. Responding Orange County deputies arrived to find two employees of a cash transporting company waiting outside in an armored truck for a routine cash deposit. The deputies also noticed that the employee on duty's car was in the parking lot and that there was blood on the store's exterior lock. Now, after unsuccessfully trying to call the clerk, 31-year-old Terence Terry Paquette, they contacted another store employee to bring a key and let them inside. 
The deputies encountered a horror scene when they entered the store and found Terry dead on the bathroom floor. Someone had stabbed him repeatedly and slashed his throat while he was opening up the store. The killer proceeded to steal $1,000 out of the safe and fled the scene, leaving the floors and walls covered in blood. An autopsy revealed that Terry had been stabbed 73 times in the head, heart, lungs, chest, and abdomen. Yeah, he was stabbed 73 times, uh, more to the torso, and his, his throat was actually slit. His store key was missing from the scene and has never been found. According to the Orlando Sentinel, Terry had moved to Florida from New Hampshire a handful of years before the murder. He lived alone and had no hobbies and no obvious passions, and mostly kept to himself. Terry worked at the Mini Mart up to 60 hours per week and did not drink alcohol. In other words, he was the epitome of the average Joe, and there were no outward indicators that his lifestyle would make him the likely target of a brutal murder. Now, while the nature of Terry's relationship with his family is unclear, his body wasn't returned to New Hampshire for burial. He was laid to rest in a simple grave in Seminole County, which now appears to be all but forgotten. Based on information from a family history website, Terry may have a living sister, but his surviving family seems to begin and end there. Law enforcement spent two weeks processing the murder scene for clues. A large amount of the blood found inside the store belonged to the killer, who had apparently injured themselves during the murder. And based on the pattern of the blood, investigators believed the suspects had walked around the store after being wounded. The killer's blood was found on the store's lottery machine, freezer door handle, front entrance, and elsewhere within the store. Terry had deactivated the store's alarm at 5.39 a.m. and was dead by 7 o'clock in the morning. During that time period, a person had entered the store and called out for Terry. But the person left when he didn't respond. According to the police, the killer was in the store at the time, making the customer incredibly lucky that they decided to leave when they did. A search of Terry's vehicle and apartment turned up no useful evidence. So without any witnesses to the actual murder and little evidence to go on, it wasn't long before the case began to stall. Within six weeks of Terry's death, investigators' phones had stopped ringing completely. The investigation was officially closed in 1997 with the potential of being reopened upon the discovery of new leads. In 2003, detectives took another look at the case. They ran the killer's DNA through the National Offender Database, also known as CODIS, but failed to turn up a match. Investigators also re-interviewed witnesses and were able to eliminate some persons of interest based on a reanalysis of crime scene evidence, but they failed to glean any new information and were left with zero suspects when the case once again stalled. The case was revisited yet again in 2019, following the formation of a cold case unit in Orange County. Two years later in 2021, detectives turned to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. And so just with the advancements in DNA and where we are in 2019 at the time when I opened the case, I figured there's gotta be something we can do. For help, solving the case through genetic genealogy. The relatively new science involves tracing suspects through their relatives' DNA via public platforms like Family Tree and GDmatch.com. And once we were able to identify potential um, persons of interest, we then looked into their life and seen where they were in 96. The findings pointed toward a close relative of Carol Ann Crawford and Kenneth Stuff Sr. One of the couple's three sons, Kenneth Stoff Jr., had previously worked at the convenience store where Terence was killed. And he lived right down the street at the time of the murder. In the hopes of surreptitiously obtaining a DNA sample, basically being fortunate enough to get a sample, the investigators obtained a warrant to put a tracking device on Stoff's car. 
They followed him around while waiting for him to discard a piece of garbage in public. And they eventually got their chance when he threw a bag full of empty beer cans into a dumpster near his home in Eustace. The bag contained seven 16-ounce cans of Budweiser, which was more than enough to obtain a DNA sample. Stoffs proved to be a match to the killer's blood. And in November 2021, Stoff was charged with first-degree murder and robbery with a deadly weapon. It was Orange County's first ever cold case to be solved through genetic genealogy. During a press conference announcing Stoff's arrest, Detective Brian Savelli revealed that the suspects had a history of minor arrests. Tuesday, with the assistance of our good friends at the Lake County Sheriff's Office, our detectives were able to arrest Kenneth Robert Stow Jr. for first-degree murder with a weapon. And as he admitted to being a former employee of the convenience store. Stoff also allegedly denied killing Terry, but struggled to come up with an explanation for the physical evidence. By then, all of Terence's known family members had passed away, leaving behind only some friends to notify of the new developments in the case. And while the case appeared to be solved, it would ultimately be up to a jury to decide whether law enforcement had indeed arrested the right suspect. A long-awaited conclusion. While awaiting trial in 2022, Stoff wrote a letter to the judge overseeing his case, requesting to be released from jail so he could help his fiancée with bills and expenses. Prosecutors and the local sheriff's office vocally opposed the request, citing the gruesome nature of the crime and arguing that Stoff was a flight risk. Stoff had some supporters, including neighbors, who told local station WFTV9 that the accused killer deserved to be released because he was innocent of the crime. The defendant's attorneys, on the other hand, argued that they needed Stoff's help with the case and that he could better assist in his defense if he were released on an ankle monitor. Stoff's fiance, Emily Edwards, reassured the court that she was committed to ensuring that he followed any and all of the rules set forth by the court if he were freed. The judge set bail at $300,000 with the requirement that Stoff wear an ankle monitor if he managed to come up with the funds. He would also be required to pay $500 per month for the monitor fees. In the meantime, Stoff turned down the plea deal and took the case to trial. In 2023, a jury convicted 56-year-old Stoff of first-degree murder, which carries an automatic sentence of life without parole in the state of Florida, and he's currently serving his time at a correctional facility in Orlando. In October 1970, a seemingly ordinary autumn evening in Anne Arundel County, Maryland, transformed into the beginning of a decades-long mystery. Pamela Lynn Conyers, a 16-year-old student at Glen Burnie High School, became the central figure in a perplexing case that would baffle and haunt her community for over 50 years. Now, on that fateful night, Pamela attended a pep rally at her high school, a routine event in the life teenager. But the normalcy shattered when she failed to return home after borrowing her family's car for a trip to the Harundel Plaza shopping center. The ensuing hours turned to days and a deepening sense of dread settled over the community. The discovery of Pamela's abandoned vehicle in a secluded wooded area added a chilling twist to her disappearance because near the car a more harrowing find waited the authorities, one that would cement this case in the annals of unsolved mysteries. As the days turned into weeks and months, Pamela's case became a focal point for investigators and the source of endless speculation and sorrow for those who knew her. The investigation into Pamela Conyers' disappearance and the grim discovery that followed unfolded like a complex puzzle. The pieces that seemed to defy assembly. The questions outnumbered the answers. Who was responsible for this heinous act? 
What were the circumstances leading to her untimely death? And most hauntingly, why did it happen to Pamela? As years stretched into decades, the case of Pamela Lynn Conyers remained stubbornly unsolved. A cold case in the truest sense. It became not just a story of a crime, but a narrative woven into the fabric of a community. A reminder of the fragility of life and the enduring quest for truth and justice in the face of tragedy. The disappearance of Pamela Lynn Conyers in October 1970 is a case that's shrouded in mystery and marked by a series of unsettling events and unanswered questions. Pamela, a 16-year-old high school student, vanished after attended a pet rally at Glen Burnie High School. Her last known action was driving to the Harundel Plaza shopping center, which was a seemingly ordinary errand that would culminate in a tragic end. On the night of her disappearance, Pamela's parents reported her missing when she failed to return home. The community's collective anxiety escalated over the following days as search efforts intensified. Pamela was last seen on the night of October the 16th, 1970, after she drove to a local mall to buy shoe polish for a dance that was the next day. Her car was found three days later and her body was discovered the following day in a wooded area near the car. Four days later, the grim reality came to light. She was found clothed, but her underwear and purse were missing, indicating a violent encounter. Pamela's body was found in a wooded area of Anne Arundel County, not far from the family car she had been driving. She'd been strangled to death, a finding that was later confirmed by Marilyn's chief medical examiner. The immediate aftermath of the discovery was filled with a mix of shock, grief, and a desperate need for answers. Classmate Mike Golden described the profound impact of Pamela's disappearance, saying, I remember distinctly when Pam went missing. I remember that Monday morning. I had trigonometry class with her, and seeing her empty desk really brought it home. It made it real. I still mourn her death. She's forever 16. Investigators faced a daunting task. The evidence that was collected from the scene, although significant, offered no immediate leads. In an era before advanced forensic technology, detectives were limited in their ability to extract conclusive information from the available clues. The case thus quickly grew cold, leaving Pamela's family and the community without closure. During the initial investigation, authorities collected evidence from the crime scene, but they lacked the advanced forensic technology that would later become crucial in solving such cases. As FBI Special Agent in Charge, Tom Sobachinsky explained, DNA analysis didn't exist in 1970, which meant that even though evidence was collected, it couldn't be analyzed with the precision or depth that modern science allows. This limitation significantly hindered the investigation and contributed to the case remaining unsolved for so long. Now years turned into decades and the mystery of Pamela Conyers' murder lingered. The lack of evidence linking any suspects to the crime coupled with the limitations of investigative techniques of the time, contributed to the case's enduring status as being unsolved. It wasn't until the advent of DNA analysis and investigative genetic genealogy technologies that didn't exist in the 70s, that investigators could revisit the case with new tools at their disposal. As the case remained open, the absence of closure continued to weigh heavily on those who knew Pamela. During the decades that Pamela Conyers' case remained cold, the investigation faced significant challenges. Due to the technological limitations of the time, in the years following her disappearance and murder, the case saw little progress, primarily because the tools needed to analyze the evidence effectively didn't exist. So, how did the case with such a tragic beginning and so many unanswered questions find, find its way towards a resolution after over 50 years. Pamela's case was one of 82 cold cases in Anne Arundel County at the time. The murder occurred in the same area where another young woman, Joyce Malecki, 
was last seen before her unsolved murder in 1969. The lack of a breakthrough in either case, despite their similarities and geographic proximity, added to the complexity and frustration surrounding Pamela's case. Pamela Lynn Conyers' cold case breakthrough came more than 52 years after her tragic murder in 1970 through a combination of DNA analysis and investigative genetic genealogy. In 1970, when Conyers was brutally murdered, the police collected evidence from the crime scene, but the tools to analyze it comprehensively didn't exist. So for decades, this evidence lay dormant, unable to yield the secrets it held. But this all changed with the advent of DNA analysis and investigative genetic genealogies. Tom Sobaczynski, FBI special agent in charge, highlighted the evolution of these tools. The techniques, both scientific and investigative, used to solve her murder have evolved. This technique gives the FBI a chance to solve cases that would not have been solved in any other way. Using these advanced methods, detectives developed a DNA profile from the crime scene evidence and compared it to publicly accessible genealogical databases. This allowed them to identify potential relatives of the suspect, create a family tree, and ultimately pinpoint Forrest Clyde Williams III as the perpetrator. While specific details of how the DNA led to Williams were not disclosed, the process demonstrated how evolving technology could unlock answers in seemingly unsolvable cases. Williams who was 21 at the time of Conyers' murder, had a sparse criminal history and spent most of his life in Virginia. He'd been arrested a few times in Anne Arundel County in the early 70s for minor offenses, including drunk and disorderly conduct. Unfortunately, Williams passed away in 2018, making it impossible to bring him to justice. Anne Arundel County Police Chief Amal Awad stated, if he was still alive, he would have been charged with the murder of Pamela Conyers. The revelation of Williams as the murderer brought mixed emotions. Classmate Michael Golden expressed both relief and frustration. It's still frustrating because I don't know anything about this guy. It's something all of our classmates have been grappling with for all these years. Despite the identification of Williams, the police have not ruled out the possibility of other suspects being involved in Conyers' murder. The resolution of Pamela Lynn Conyers' case over five decades after her tragic murder marks a significant moment in the annals of criminal investigation. The use of advanced DNA technology and investigative genetic genealogy brought closure to a case that had long remained an enigma, offering some semblance of solace to those affected by the tragedy. Anne Arundel County Police Chief Amal Awad Reflecting on this achievement stated, To the family and loved ones of Pamela, we hope that today's announcement brings at least some degree of comfort and peace in finally learning who was responsible for her murder. Pamela was never forgotten, nor sh will she ever be forgotten. And that sentiment underscores the commitment of law enforcement to pursue justice, irrespective of the time elapsed. The breakthrough in the case came with the identification of Forrest Clyde Williams as the perpetrator, a revelation that brought mixed emotions. While it provided answers, it also raised new questions, especially since Williams had passed away in 2018, precluding any possibility of his prosecution. The inability to bring Williams to trial leaves a gap in the full closure of the case. For those who knew Pamela, like her classmate, Michael Golden, the resolution brought both a sense of closure and a renewed sense of loss. Despite the identification of the killer, the mystery surrounding Williams and his motives continue to linger in the minds of Pamela's classmates and the community. But this case serves to highlight the significant advancements in forensic science and the impact of these technologies on solving cold cases. FBI agent Tom Sobaczynski's statement reflects this progress. 
Cases may grow cold, investigators may change, but this proves that for law enforcement, victims are never forgotten. This breakthrough has not only brought some degree of closure to Pamela's family and friends, but also it stands as a beacon of hope for other cold cases, demonstrating that justice, though sometimes delayed, is always a pursuit worth undertaking. In conclusion, the resolution of Pamela Lynn Conyers' murder case is a bittersweet mix of justice served and questions unanswered. It brings some small measure of closure to her family and friends and serves as a testament to the perseverance and the dedication of law enforcement in the pursuit of truth and justice, no matter how long it takes. In the quiet, verdant expanses of northern Kentucky, on June the 4th, 1976, it began like any other summer day. But amidst this serene backdrop, a harrowing crime unfolded that would haunt the community for decades. The year 1966 in Boone County, Kentucky, marked a time of innocence for many. But it was also the year that innocence was shattered for the Kleber family. Carol Sue Kleber, a 16-year-old with dreams as wide as the Kentucky skies, was brutally murdered. A case growing colder as the years stretched on. It would take over four decades, the advent of DNA technology and the unwavering dedication of law enforcement to finally shed light on the darkness of that fateful day. On June the 4th, 1976, in the picturesque environment of Northern Kentucky, a seemingly ordinary day transformed into a pivotal moment in the life of the Park Hills community. Carol Sue Kleber, a 16-year-old teenager, embarked on a routine bike ride through the tranquil paths of DeVoe Park, unaware that this would be the last. The day, etched in the collective memory of the town, began like any other. But as the hours passed, a sense of unease permeated the Kleber household. Carol, known for her punctuality and responsible nature, did not return home. As the sun dipped below the horizon, worry turned into panic. The local authorities were alerted, and a search ensued. Witnesses came forward with a critical piece of information. Carol had been seen getting into a white car, either a Chevrolet or a Pontiac, in the park. This car, driven by an unidentified male, was the last place Carol was seen alive. The community rallied with neighbors and friends joining the search, but the night yielded no trace of Carol. The following day, June the 5th, brought a grim discovery. Carol's body was found in a roadside ditch near Walton, Kentucky, a mere short distance from where she was last seen. A dentist, passing by the area, stumbled upon the scene and immediately reported it to the authorities. The discovery sent shockwaves through the community, turning the missing person's case into a homicide investigation. The Kentucky State Police took charge, examining the site where Carol was found, hoping to piece together the final moments of her life. The autopsy revealed heart-wrenching details. Carol had been subjected to sexual assault, strangled and ultimately succumbed to blunt force trauma. This heinous crime, perpetrated against a young and vibrant life, left the community breathing. The Glaber family, engulfed in grief, struggled to comprehend the brutality of the act. Friends and neighbors mourned, remembering Carol as a joyful music-loving teenager, whose absence left a void that could never be filled. The investigation into Carol's disappearance and murder initially seemed quite promising, with leads and potential suspects. However, as days turned into months and months into years, the case gradually grew cold. The lack of conclusive evidence coupled with the passing of time buried the case under layers of unresolved mystery. Carol's disappearance and tragic death remained an open wound in the heart of the community, a very poignant reminder of a life that was cut short and the family's enduring quest for justice. In the immediate aftermath of Carol's death, the Kentucky State Police launched 
an extensive investigation. Witnesses accounts and the forensic evidence collected at the crime scene, including DNA and fingerprints, initially seemed promising. However, the trail soon went cold. The initial leads and suspects upon deeper investigation provided no concrete connection to the crime. As years passed, the lack of technological advancement in forensic science and the diminishing of new leads contributed to the case's dormancy. The DNA and fingerprints collected, though crucial, would not be fully utilized due to the limitations of forensic technology at the time. Carol's brother, Thomas Glaber, found himself in a relentless pursuit of justice for his sister. The image of identifying Carol's body was etched, permanent in his mind, fueling his determination. He frequently contacted law enforcement, urging them to keep the investigation alive. Thomas relentlessly pushed for a re-examination of the evidence, hoping that at some point advancements in forensic technology might just shed some new light on the case. But despite his efforts, the case remained in the shadows, with the years soon turning into decades without any significant progress. Anniversaries of Carol's death were commemorated with vigils where townsfolk would gather, candles flickering against the encroaching darkness, a symbol of the light of Carol's life that was so brutally extinguished. Her classmates graduated, they married, started families of their own, all the while carrying the burden of the question, who killed Carol Sue Kleber? Throughout the years, the case saw occasional revisits by detectives each time, hoping to uncover something missed by their predecessors. Yet, each review concluded similarly, with no new leads or suspects. The case exemplified the challenges law enforcement faced with cold cases, limited resources, evolving personnel, and the constant influx of new cases taking precedence over older, unsolved mysteries. The technological limitations of the era played a significant role in the case remaining unsolved. Forensic science in the 1970s and 1980s was by no means as advanced as it is today, particularly in DNA profiling and analysis. The evidence collected from Carol's murder scene held potential clues, but the capability to extract definitive information from such evidence was years away. This gap in technological capability meant that despite the evidence in hand, the authorities could not pinpoint the perpetrator. Now, after languishing in the annals of unsolved mysteries for nearly half a century, the Carol Sue Claver case experienced a remarkable breakthrough, exemplifying the profound impact of advancements in forensic science and dogged investigative persistence. The pivotal moment in this protracted mystery came in 2017, with the establishment of the Boone County Sheriff's Office Cold Case Unit. Detectives Coy Cox and Tim Adams, assigned to the unit, reopened Carol's case, bringing new perspectives and technological tools to the decades-old investigation. The detectives still faced a daunting task, sifting through old evidence, re-examining witness statements and leveraging modern forensic techniques that were unavailable during the initial investigation. But the game-changer in the case was the advancements in DNA analysis technology. Forensic science had progressed significantly since 1976, particularly in the field of genetic genealogy. The cold case unit decided to utilize these advancements to re-analyze the DNA evidence collected from the crime scene. And the key piece of evidence was a DNA sample that had been preserved but couldn't be fully analyzed with the technology available in the 1970s and 1980s. This breakthrough came when this DNA sample was sent to Orthrum Inc., which is a specialized forensic lab in Houston. In September 2022, using forensic-grade genome sequencing, Orthrum Lab was able to construct a detailed DNA profile of the suspect this cutting-edge technique allowed for 
a more comprehensive analysis of the genetic material than had ever been possible. Orthram's in-house genealogy team employed genetic genealogy to develop investigative leads. This method involves creating family trees based on DNA profiles, enabling detectives to trace genetic connections and identify potential suspects. And in January of 2023, Orthram contacted the Boone County Sheriff's Office with a crucial recommendation to compare the DNA profile against a specific family's genetic material for potential matches. And it was this recommendation that led detectives directly to Thomas W. Dunaway, a then 19-year-old resident of Park Hills, Kentucky, where Carol's family lived. Dunaway had been overlooked in the initial investigation. He had owned a 1973 Chevrolet Monte Carlo, similar to the vehicle witnesses described seeing Carol enter. This convergence of circumstantial and DNA evidence solidified Dunaway as the prime suspect. Dunaway's history further corroborated his likelihood of being the perpetrator. He had enlisted in the army shortly after Carol's murder but later deserted. He was later convicted of another murder, reinforcing his violent predispositions. Unfortunately, Dunaway passed away in 1990, recluding the possibility of his arrest and trial for Carol's murder. Despite this, the identification of Dunaway as the perpetrator brought some measure of closure to a case that had long seemed hopeless. The case of Carol Sue Kleber now closed after nearly 46 years. The success in solving Carol's murder underscores the importance of revisiting cold cases with new technologies and perspectives, demonstrating that even the coldest cases can be solved and bring in long delayed justice and closure to families and communities. The detectives found the truth hiding in plain sight a mere mile and a half from where Carol lived. Dunaway had been a shadow in the background of Carol's life. A ghost from her past that returned with deadly consequences. In a bittersweet twist of fate, Dunaway was no longer alive to face justice for his crime having died in 1990. Yet in a final act of investigative determination, his remains were exhumed and his DNA was confirmed to match the evidence from Carol's case. This act not only served to close the chapter on Carol's murder, but also opened the possibility of resolving other cold cases, cementing the legacy of a case that had once seemed doomed to obscurity. The resolution of Carol Sue Kleber's murder case nearly five decades after her tragic death stands as a testament to the relentless pursuit of justice, the remarkable evolution of forensic science, the case which had haunted the Park Hills community in northern Kentucky for years, finally reached its denouement through a combination of advanced forensic technology and the unwavering dedication of law enforcement officers. This case's conclusion brings to light several crucial aspects of criminal investigations and the judicial system. First and foremost, it underscores the importance of perseverance in solving cold cases. Detectives Coy Cox and Tim Adams, along with their colleagues in the Boone County Sheriff's Office Cold Case Unit, exemplified this commitment their decision to revisit the case, to dig through the layers of time and dust, and to apply modern forensic techniques was pivotal in unmasking the perpetrator. The use of genetic genealogy in this case highlights a significant advancement in crime-solving methodologies. The technique, which involves the construction of family trees using DNA profiles, has revolutionized how cold cases are approached. In Carol's case, it allowed detectives to build a genetic profile of the suspect, leading them to Thomas W. Dunaway, who for years had remained outside the sphere of suspicion. The ability to link DNA from decades-old evidence 
to a specific individual is a powerful tool that has opened new doors in the field of criminal justice. Carol's case also brings into focus the emotional journey of the families involved in such tragedies. For Carol's brother, Thomas Kleber, the resolution was bittersweet, while he expressed a sense of relief that the mystery of his sister's death had finally been solved. There was also a profound sense of grief and frustration. Dunaway's death in 1990 meant that he would never stand trial for Carol's murder. Denying the family a certain degree of closure that the trial might have provided. Furthermore, the case demonstrates the ever-evolving nature of forensic science and its critical role in the judicial process. The evidence, which had remained inconclusive for years, was re-evaluated with new technology, leading to a breakthrough that had seemed impossible for decades. This advancement not only brings hope to other families waiting for answers in similar cold cases, but it also serves as a reminder of the need for continued investment in forensic science. The resolution of the Carol Sue Kleber case is a poignant reminder of the unsolved mysteries that still linger in communities across the world. It encourages law enforcement agencies to revisit unsolved cases with new tools and new perspectives. The case also serves as a sobering reminder of the impact of violent crime on families and communities, leaving scars that can take decades to heal, sometimes never fully. In conclusion, while justice in the Carol Sue Kleber case came many years after the crime, it did bring a measure of closure to a long-standing mystery, and it stands as a beacon of hope for other unsolved cases, proving that with determination and the application of modern science, the truth can eventually be uncovered, no matter how much time has passed.